number 10, Latin. Out of all of the dead languages, Latin is probably one of the most well known. You might be saying, well, it isn't completely dead because Latin is still somewhat around in society. While you do have a point, Latin is still considered a dead language because no one speaks it. It is still used to classify animal species and science and is also used in medical terms as well, but you won't hear someone speaking Latin just out and about. The most Latin that the average person would use in normal everyday speech would be saying some kind of Latin phrase like carpe diem, which means seize the day, or memento mori, which means remember you must die. Certainly not as upbeat as carpe diem, but it's still got the same principle. These days, the only country that uses Latin as their official language is the Vatican. And yes, for those who never knew this, Vatican City is its own country. The reason why Latin is their official language is because the holy scriptures are written in this dead language. They are the only ones who have kept up with it after the language started dying out after the fall of Rome. At number 9, Sanskrit. The ancient language Sanskrit is the oldest language in the world, but unfortunately the language died out around 600 BCE, so a very long time ago. Though it died out so long ago, it still seems to be holding on a little bit, even in modern day in some countries. Currently, Sanskrit is considered one of India's official languages because of the fact that many ancient scriptures regarding Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism are written in this ancient language. Sanskrit also holds on to a lot of popularity among scholars as it is a popular study for many students because of its ties to many ancient philosophical works like the spiritual and medical theories written by the popular philosopher Vedas. Before we carry on talking about some of humanity's dead languages, why not consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one. On number 8, Ancient Greek. Up next, we have a pretty special language, this being Ancient Greek. Many people still study some Ancient Greek because of the works of some of Ancient Greece's most famous philosophers like Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and Homer. On top of that, much like Latin, many scientific terminologies are written in Ancient Greek. Now, I mentioned that this is a pretty special language, so let me tell you about what makes it so unique. The death of ancient Greek is pretty special because it didn't necessarily die out completely. Strange, I know. You see, rather than the language dying out completely, it simply got transformed into what we now know as modern Greek. So really, it's not exactly the same, but it just evolved into something new. Now, modern Greek is used as the official language of Greece. Even though the language, or rather some of its remnants, are still around, ancient Greek is still studied to this day, and fun fact, many words from the English language are derived from ancient Greek. At number 7, Biblical Hebrew. The death of the Biblical Hebrew language is a pretty sad one. There are many ways for a culture or language to die out, and most times it has to do with some kind of conflict, overtaking, or assimilation. In the case of Biblical Hebrew, this language died out in the 20th century due to warfare and persecution. Biblical Hebrew initially saw its decline after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, but after the events of World War II and the persecution of the Jewish population, Biblical Hebrew lost any hope of returning. Most of the rabbis who could have passed along this language died during the war, and so this ancient 8,000 word language transformed into modern Hebrew. It is still possible to learn the language, but no one really uses it anymore. One cool thing about learning this language though is the fact that it would be a much easier language to pick up than any other dead language. At number 6, Old English. Obviously, we need to talk about the language that came before ours, that being Old English. This is the language that came before the modern English that we speak today, and even before the middle and early modern English that you may be familiar with if you ever had to study Shakespeare. It was the first recorded stage of the English language that was used and spoken up until approximately the 1150s. Old English had three genders to the language, masculine, neuter, and feminine. Old English, also referred to as Anglo-Saxon English, was spoken by people in England and Scotland, hence the name. Eventually, it evolved into a more grammatically correct version of English that we call Middle English, and this old form quickly died out, giving way to this newer version. The English language has undergone a lot of transformation over many years, so I wonder if you'll see another transition in this language in the future. At number 5, Coptic. When you think of the ancient Egyptian language, you would probably imagine the hieroglyphs that these ancient people were known for. Coptic was actually the final stage of the ancient Egyptian language before it was replaced with Arabic, and it was written using the Greek alphabet. Coptic was also considered to be the first ever Christian language. 
It was created as a result of four different languages, those being Greek, Demotic, Hieratic, and the Hieroglyphs. For some time, Coptic was preserved as a religious language, but it died out after about 300 years. There are no languages out there that are even close to Coptic, making this one very unique. At number 4, Ayapaneco. Now this next language isn't exactly extinct, but it is severely endangered because there's only a small handful of people left in the world who still speak it. Ayapaneco is a critically endangered language that originated in Tabasco, Mexico. From what I understand, there are only two native speakers of this language left, but the issue is that those two people refuse to speak to each other and no one knows why, which is a bit mysterious. People say that they just don't get along, but again, the reason for that is unknown. The reason that this language has pretty much died off is because of the severe lack of native speakers. This is all thanks to 20th century Spanish educational reform, where children were forced to not speak in any other languages other than those which were approved. It's so sad that this language has pretty much gone all because of outsider influence. At number 3, Aramaic. This next language is pretty special because it's one that is said to have been spoken by Jesus Christ himself. The Aramaic language was, in its heyday, the primary language because it was so widely used. This language is also the one that replaced the highly complex Akkadian language, which we will talk about in a few moments. There are Aramaic speakers, but none of them actually came from the country which this language originated. This dead language came from Aram, but the country fell to the Assyrians back in ancient times. However, despite the destruction of Aram, their language remained fairly intact as the Assyrians used it as a second language given its significance and popularity since it was the lingua franca of the Middle East. The reason that this language eventually died out was due to the diaspora of the people who spoke it. There was a point where some researchers feared that the language would be gone by the next century. However, thanks to the historical significance of the language, as well as the texts that still need to be researched in its language, Aramaic still remains preserved, unused but not completely lost. At number 2, Old Norse. Now let's talk about the language that was used by one of the most interesting civilizations from the past. We all know about the Vikings. We've done a few videos about them on this channel so far, but no one has really talked about how they spoke, so let's get into it. The Vikings spoke Old Norse. It was unique to the Vikings, but it ultimately died off in a similar way to the Aramaic language. As the Vikings split off and became individual groups like Icelandic, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, and Faroes, the language kind of just faded away over time. Though the entirety of Old Norse has been lost for the most part, some remnants still remain in the English language. Since both Old Norse and English stem from the Germanic family, they share similarities and this is how we got words like cake, knife, and berserk. They came from the Vikings. On top of that, the word Thursday came from the Vikings Thor's Day, as in the god, and the word husband came from Old Norse as well as it was a mashup of the words hus and bondi. And finally, at number one, Akkadian. The ancient language Akkadian originated in Akkad, an old Mesopotamian city from ancient times. This language was actually the first certified Semitic language in history. If you learned about Mesopotamia, then you would probably be familiar with its written form of the language called cuneiform. Akkadian was spoken by the likes of Mesopotamians, Babylonians, and Chaldeans. But unfortunately, due to the language's inability to evolve, it ultimately died out, as I mentioned when talking about Aramaic, since that language was the one to replace Akkadian. This language is very much dead, unless you want to learn cuneiform, which in that case, you'd have to learn Akkadian as well. Number 10, Queen of the Red Sails. In history, when men drop the ball, there's always an iron-willed woman to pick up the slack. Not because a man is telling her to, but because she wants to. How about inheriting a whole pirate fleet from your late husband? Meet Zhang Yi Sao. Her husband had managed to build quite the little nautical empire, and with his untimely passing, she became the boss. She commanded a fleet of over 400 ships, and estimated between 20 to 60,000 pirates at her peak. She's noted for organizing and uniting pirates into a confederation. She also had some imperial entanglements, having entered conflict with the East India Company and the Portuguese Empire. This is a lot to go through, especially when I get anxiety from being left alone at the cashier at the grocery store. Number 9. Double Trouble The Trung sisters from Vietnam are still celebrated today because, honey, they went through a lot. 
The sisters led the first resistance against Chinese dominance, which at the time had lasted over 247 years. Many believe Vietnam wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for their efforts, gathering 80,000 people to join their cause, once killing a tiger and writing a proclamation of war on its hide. They managed to hold off the Chinese forces for three years before finally being overtaken. The Trung sisters are a great deal of national pride and pride amongst many women in Vietnam. Sadly, the Chinese proved too strong. But to prevent capture, the sisters later drowned in a last fit of defiance. Number 8. Hell Hath No Fury The Roman Empire was just about good at everything. Politics, culture, building a city that would stand the test of time and eventually outlive their civilization. But perhaps the Romans' strongest attribute was their military. I mean, come on, it's Rome. No introduction is needed here. So when a man was worried that the Romans he had worked with might take over his homeland after he had passed, he left a note in his will saying, please do not take this. This is mine. Don't take it. I'll give the folks at home a second to think about what the Romans did next. If you guessed annex his homeland and do non-YouTube friendly conduct things to his wife and daughter, you'd be correct. His wife, Boudicca, not feeling so cool about what happened, took some action by gathering the tribe together and revolting against the Romans. Defeating the scrambled Romans in a battle, she then made her way to Londinium, or what's now London, and had it burned. There were empires that couldn't take down the Roman Empire, and Boudicca did it like it was nothing. They did end up losing, and once again to avoid capture, drank poison. But come on, she took down the Romans. Number 7. Viva la Revolution Juana da Padilla was born in Spanish-controlled Peru to two loving parents. Like many classic stories, her mother sadly passed away when she was young, where she grew very attached to her father. Although unusual for the time, her father instructed her on how to horse ride and sharpshoot. Even helped her father work during the days. They were pretty tight, but like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, there's a double twist. Her father passed away in her teens. Now an orphan, she was forced to move in with her aunt, where she quite possibly developed the very first feelings of teenage angst before there was ever an Avril Lavigne album. Juana would often have outbursts that got her eventually sent to become a nun, where that also did not go very well. During her studies, she was fond of Joan of Arc, but eventually she was expelled at a young age of 17. After years of witnessing colonial reign, she joined the revolution. She became so passionate about the cause she once fought a battle while pregnant, went back to have a baby, and then went back to battle with the baby strapped to her back. Man, sometimes I don't even want to get up after a large meal. What a woman! Number 6. Not One Step Back Ludmila Pavlchenko was just like any other girl in Russia in the 1940s. She was in her last year of university, when history's favorite mustache man invaded history's second favorite mustache man. Feeling inspired by her country's call to arms, she signed up for military service. She would eventually find her way to be a sharpshooter. During the siege of Odessa, she is credited with 187 confirmed kills. She married a fellow sniper, he died, then she went on to have over 300 confirmed kills when the war was over. Once the military realized how valuable she was, she was pulled from the front lines, where she became key propaganda for Russia. She would also find herself training young snipers up until the end of the war. She was oftentimes referred to as the Lady of Death. Number 5. The Limping Lady World War II was the cause and effect for a lot of things. If you like spies and espionage, it's kind of where it all started. One of the best spies who did more than her fair share was Virginia Hall. A lady with a peg leg who thwarted German plans again and again. With her sidekick and peg leg nicknamed Cuthbert. She was credited by top German officials as being the most dangerous spy of all time. In one OSS report, her team is credited with destroying four bridges, derailing a freight train, and neutralizing 150 enemies with hundreds more captured. Now, I'm not a world class detective or anything, but I feel like if you're trying to find the female spy with a peg leg, it isn't that hard, on account of, you know, some pretty specific identifying features. I don't know how you messed that up. Where is the lady? Where is her? And you like hear her walking down the hall, she's got a peg leg. What do you mean? Number four, Miss General. Fu Hao was one of 60 wives to Emperor Wu Ding, which I'm not sure even Mormons can figure that out. But to avoid obscuring into the background like TV's least favorite sister wife, she took control. According to records, she led many successful military campaigns and commanded an army of 13,000. While stories of the past can get lost, this is most likely true as her tomb was full of many different weapons like great axes. 
which was common to bury distinguished generals with at the time. When I'm buried as a warrior princess, I want my collection of pop figures to come with me. I spent too much time on those bad boys to not take them with me to the afterlife. Number 3 Fatality Tamiris was the queen of Mazagate. Or at least I think that's how it's pronounced. A confederation of nomadic tribes that lived east of the Caspian Sea. She ruled during the 6th century BC and is most famous for her vengeful war she waged against the Persian king Cyrus the Great. At first, the war wasn't going too great. Unfortunately, her son claimed his life out of shame for losing in battle. Mom was not happy and promised the bloodiest battle ever. Well, she wasn't lying. As the promised battle was very bloody, many Persians perished in battle, including Cyrus. When his body was recovered, the vengeful queen harnessed the power of mid-90s fighting games and removed his head and turned his skull into a cup and proclaimed, drink your fill of blood. Nice. Number 2. The Beautiful Samurai What does it mean to be a samurai? Armor, a kick-ass sword, and a coat of honor? Yes, it does. And Tomoe Gozen did it all and had time to look good doing it. Tomoe Gozen's life is shrouded in mystery and many debate her existence, but whatever be the case, she did leave a mark on history. A very red stain mark on history. Earning the respect of the men around her, it was stated that she had long black hair and a fair complexion and was in command of a large number of men. However, her biggest claim to fame when she was approached by multiple foes, she rode right at them, grabbing their leader and liberating his head from his shoulders. Wow, you slay it, queen. Number one, who else could it go to but the maid of Orleone? All the badass women who went through a lot on this list, they seen some stuff, honey. But Joan, Joan of Arc, girl, she takes the cake. Joan was born a poor peasant, but had a unique gift. She could speak to the gods, and the gods told her it was her time to shine. By the time she was 19, she had led thousands of men to battle and in glorious victory. Charles VII, losing the 100 Years War at the time, said, All right, sure, send the girl to fight. What have we got to lose? Well, they actually had a lot to win. Once Joan had gotten involved, the French began to win victory after victory, and her claims of being guided by God didn't seem so far fetched after all. The British, being so shaken up by the young girl's military prowess, thought she had been possessed by the devil. The British, not liking losing war to a teenage girl, decided to treat her with compassion by keeping her warm with a fire while she was tied to a wooden post. Joan would later become a legend for her efforts because getting burned at the stake is honestly a lot and I can't even deal. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. 
Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Ooh, here we go. Nowadays, you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times, if it wasn't horse hair, it was thin long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm going to stick to the spearmint. Spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. 
Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So depends really where I am, but kind of, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kind of, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Kicking off the list at number 10, wiper no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go 
where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy had a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers are responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, doormat toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, shards and shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I could do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all. Not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're gonna, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, there you go. Number five, 
shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, Aqua Tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tofania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think? I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Rays is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Rays is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesborough Ponds bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box, a warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. 
The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on, but today there's a visine luckily for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Ebers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription, you're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the great stink. Yeah, the great stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just 
great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks, good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play. Might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un, just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Tan line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band-aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo-boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church and they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now. I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. 
We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean I could eat a little bit more but water is more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the industrial revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with it, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> At number 10, treaties of the vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I for one would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the treaties of the vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is and the treaties of the vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number 9. Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lot of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At number 8, Librelintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text's meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etrusian language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number 7, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas and after being translated might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot it, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have said
said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number six, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art turn out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. At number 5, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Counsel, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two heroes twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popol Vuh dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 70 CE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya quote would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number 2, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun! That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250-page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies, is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer, and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language, or code, or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is? An alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? 
right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient texts for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is ripped in, in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Number 10. Capture over choice. Consent is my favorite word. It really is, because it's important. But back in ancient times, wasn't really a word anyone really understood. Thousands of years ago, couples skipped right over dating and instead went from captured to married. In fact, it was this idea that kind of sparked the origin of the honeymoon. A bride would be captured from a tribe, the tribe would go looking for her, and the thief would hide her away until they stopped. If you have watched the Spartan video on Bumblebee, if you haven't, go check it out, then you may know that their marriage ceremony centered on this as well, kind of, sorta, of, but it was, but consent was involved. As a way of courting, the women would wrestle to demonstrate their physical prowess and vice versa. They would watch the men as well and they would kind of simultaneously be like, yep, you. Then the woman's head would be shorn, they would dress them as a boy, and then they would be placed in a dark room and then wait for their betrothed to capture them and take them away. So very confusing there. I don't really understand it. But anyways, let's move on. Number nine, love letters. So nice. Today, it's easy to send a saucy text and an explicit pic to your partner or fling, or a person you're just friends with but you know. Or the person you've been seeing for like half a year but they're not your BF or GF, like no. Anyways, the rules are up in the air. But back then you had to wait with bated breath to receive a thought out letter from your lover, filled with poetry and extravagant flirtations and little drawings. There are love notes between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Henry even drew little doodles of a man depicted in lovesick sorrows. Anne then wrote back with drawings showing her talking to the angel Gabriel being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a son. The Tudor version of the emoji. One of their exchanges went, and I quote, If you remember my love and your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall scarcely be forgotten, for I am yours, Henry Rex forever. And then Anne's response was, Be daily prove you shall me find, to be to you both loving and kind. And then he cut her head off. How quickly the milk turned sour. But it was the way to play back then, and soon you'd have stacks of letters with declarations of love as you're heading to the chopping block with the guy beside you. Awful way to go. Awful way to go. Henry, you suck. Number eight, escort cards. Today, someone might ask you for you to give them your number so they can text you, you up at like 3 a.m. No, you're not. You're asleep because you have to work the next day. If you lived in the Victorian era, you may have dropped a calling card instead, or an escort card. Want to go on a date? Here's my card. It doesn't sound so romantic, but social calling cards didn't have your usual brick printing and beige background. Social calling cards were lavish, enticing, elegant, with bright colors and lush paper. If a man wanted to court a woman, he would hand her his calling card, which would not only include his name, but compliments to her. Kind of like a Valentine's Day card, but every day of the year. If a woman was the bee's knees and she was unmarried, she'd often return home with stacks of them. If she was particularly fond of one of them, she might take up the offer presented with the card, the offer of escorting a woman to and from a future social gathering. She would send her servant to deliver the news with her own calling card in response. This process was repeated several times and either amounted to something steady or flittered out. 
We all know what a ghosted text feels like, so I imagine this would be kind of the same. Number seven, knives. Huh? If someone ever hands you a knife outside of lending it to you to eat your lunch, be wary, they may be trying to court you. In some Nordic countries, some courtship rituals involved knives. In Finland, for example, when a girl came of age to start courting, her father would give her an empty sheath to wear. It would be attached to her girdle, and when a suitor liked her, he would put his knife in her sheath. <laughs> if the girl was interested, she would keep it. If not, she would give it back. <laughs> Good old nonverbal communication. No. But also imagine putting a knife into the hand of someone you just denied. Ooh. If she kept it, this was also a signal to other suitors that she was taken and not interested in pursuing others. The idea of giving a woman a token of affection that she could use to signal her own interests is seen in many cultures, such as. What's next? Number six. Spoons! We talked about knives that fit their sheaths. Now let's talk about spoons. Spoons! Dating back all the way to 17th century Wales, suitors would give ornately carved love spoons. They would make it from a single piece of wood to show his affection to his intended. On the spoon, there would be engravings which would symbolize intention, i.e. an anchor, for instance, would mean I desire to settle down, and the vine would mean something like love grows. Rural peasants used wooden spoons to eat and prepare food, so carving spoons to use every day was a usual chore. The most beautiful spoons were kept therefore to keep as gifts, to give to those you loved or wanted to. The better the spoon, the finer the details, the finer the craftsman, the better the husband, which signaled to the love interest that they were reliable and skilled. The tradition is not specifically unique to Wales, in fact it happened in many Celtic countries. Number 5. Dating and Dangerous so fun fact, after the Victorian era, or and slash kind of during, going on dates was uh, scandalous, like pretty kind of oof. The term date is a relatively new term. It was coined just before the turn of the century. George Add wrote in the Chicago Record about young women filling up the dates in their calendar with rendezvous with young men, and that was in 1896. In the 1900s, it took a little bit of adjusting. This, therefore, set the term kind of date as women going on dates. In the 1900s, this took a little bit of adjusting. A woman out alone with a man, without a chaperone, at night, and not a courtesan? How scandalous! As more and more women started doing it, people weren't sure how to react. Law enforcement even got involved because they would see a woman alone with a man and be like, she's a woman of the night, and then they'd arrest her, or they would be confused. But either way, in the eyes of the law, dating kind of became a crime. Women making a date seemed like they were pulling something else, so sometimes it was illegal to date, though other times it was like, dude, just stop, we're trying to go get dinner. Leave us alone. Number four, the art of the fan. Ooh. Being entirely open about who you were pursuing could raise a lot of eyebrows and damage one's reputation. So nobles often had to code their advances behind the art of the fan, mostly women, actually all women. If you have ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, you may have noticed Glenn Close elegantly using her fan to seduce and manipulate gentlemen callers around her finger. And that really how it was. It was all a game only the cleverest suitors could decode. Carrying it in the right hand in front of your face? Follow me. Placing it on the left ear? I wish to get rid of you. With the handle to the lips? Kiss me. A society lady in the 18th century was expected to know how to elegantly handle and hold a fan. This also helped differentiate between social classes. So not only was it used to set up a secret meeting in the garden with your betrothed lover, it was also used to communicate gossip and information. Number three, classified ads. Today we have so many dating apps, it's dizzying. You can swipe left, you can swipe right for your dream bow, any which way you like, Hinge, Tinder, Bumble, is that all there is? Plenty of fish, I don't know. It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't the first time people tried it this way. Enter classified ads. Uh, or personalized ads. If you were desperate for love and knew your person was out there but you just hadn't run into them yet, you would make an ad. 
1722, a Bostonian took space in the New England Current to put out an ad for, and I quote, any young gentlewoman that is minded to dispose of herself in marriage to a well accomplished young widower and has five or six hundred pounds to secure to him by deed of gift, she may repair to the sign of the glass lanthorn in Steeple Square to find all the encouragement she can reasonably desire. And unquote. It was written by a 16 year old Benjamin Franklin. Oh, bless. Some would even put out ads to capture the attention of someone they saw in passing. Take, for instance, this 1748 printing calling for, and I quote, a lady genteelly dressed. This is to acquaint her that if she is disengaged and inclinable to marry a gentleman who was on that occasion is desirous of making honorable proposals. <laughs> so cute. And now we know that all those dating apps were just a matter of time. Number two, bedding ceremonies. Okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't. I can't think of anything I would like least in the world Ugh, than to have an entire room full of guests during one of the most private moments in anyone's life, especially my parents. Ugh. Now, first comes dating, or courting as it were, then comes marriage slash sometimes they would just skip over dating and just go right to an arranged marriage, especially if you were a noble. And then for a long time comes your aunts, uncles, and parents into the bedding chamber to watch the consummation. Yay! A crowd of people would be there up until the very last second when the curtains were drawn, cheering you on. <laughs> Some would even like offer advice, like don't do that, do this. Some even stayed well past. For instance, on the wedding night of the young King Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, they had two nurses in attendance to make sure the ordeal went down. But this wasn't just in Europe, this also happened in China in the early 1900s. Number one, bundling. Probably one of the most awkward ceremonies ever to take place, As, except for that one. That's the worst. But this is specifically to do with before getting married. As we have gathered thus far, being young and in love, or just being in love in general, has never been too easy. Bundling was a way to make it easier, I guess. I don't know. This 17th century tradition involved having your beau invited over, the parents needed to approve it, of course, and then you were to spend the night sleeping next to each other bundled up to the neck or sometimes just the waist like in like a human sack and then you would sleep next to each other with a plank of wood in the middle. So romantic. The tradition was meant as a way to gauge chemistry between the two lovebirds. The two would get to know each other by talking and sleeping together only before engaging in marriage. If it didn't go well, then they wouldn't get married. If it did go well, so much so that they unwrapped each other like Christmas presents on Christmas morning, then they pretty much got married like as soon as possible. The tradition was pretty popular in Ireland, the rural United Kingdom, and the New England colonies from 16th century into the 18th, but a lot of Victorian ideals were completely against it. They were like, no, corset it up and no Love. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Murdochs. With the high profile of this ongoing case, coupled with the fact that Netflix just released a chilling documentary about the story of this family, it is likely that you may already have quite the idea of who the Murdoch family is. Taylor and I have been watching the documentary series for past the first few episodes, and man, is this story wild. A few years ago, if someone asked you who the Murdoch family was, you would have likely described them as one of the most powerful families in South Carolina with a legal dynasty that has spanned for a century. Now, if I asked you that same question, the answer would be a family who had it all. Money, power, status, but some of the members flew a little too close to the sun, tragedy ensued, and now people have lost their lives and the family has been destroyed. It started back in 2015 with the death of Stephen Smith. It carries on to 2018 when Gloria Satterfield, a long-serving employee for the family, was found passed away after a quote, trip and fall accident. These events are both horrible and completely atrocious, but despite the rumors, mysteries, and alleged conspirators of these deaths, things really started to unravel for the family in February of 2019 with the death of Mallory Beach. The young woman met her untimely fate after a boating accident where, allegedly, 19-year-old Paul Murdoch was at the wheel, intoxicated. We could spend hours and hours talking about this family and all of these cases and the conspiracies, but we are short for time, which brings me right to the most recent tragedy. The 2021 killings of that same Murdoch who was driving the boat, as well as the killing of his mother, Margaret. Now, I do believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, but it is important 
important to note that the one on trial for these killings right now is the father and husband to the deceased, Alex Murdoch, the patriarch of the family who is supposed to be carrying on that Murdoch legacy. The stories surrounding this family are horrific, tragic, and a reminder of the dangers that money and power can bring. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Sacklers. This family is the one behind the dynasty of Purdue Pharma, who is best known for producing an exceptionally strong prescription painkiller. Of course, we all know just how big and rich a pharmaceutical company could get, especially one that has been around for quite some time. The company was first created in 1952 by three Brooklyn-born brothers, and in the beginning, the company mostly dealt in things like laxatives and earwax removal methods. Soon, things for the company took quite an upwards turn, and before anyone knew it, the family was regarded as one of the most esteemed New York families, but they were also known for their philanthropic tendencies, with their names on museums and hospitals, some of the most famous in the world. You see, the thing is, when they released this painkiller in 1995, it led to them amassing an insane $13 billion fortune. That is obviously incredible, but the trouble came when it was realized that this painkiller wasn't nearly as potent as it was marketed to be, and frequent users would be building up a tolerance to it, meaning they needed to use higher and higher dosages. Viewer, welcome to the opioid crisis. Basically, this all spiraled out of control and led to many, many lawsuits coming against Purdue Pharma. Not only by individuals, but by January 2019, 36 states were suing the company for what the painkiller had done to their citizens. After two years of deliberations, the Sacklers finally reached a deal with plaintiffs in bankruptcy court in September of 2021. As part of their Chapter 11 proposal, they agreed to pay $4.5 billion and give up all ownership of the company in exchange for complete immunity and all future opioid liability. Despite this fall from grace, the Sacklers were able to move an alleged $1.36 billion into offshore accounts, so despite their bankruptcy filing and the large sum of money handed over, they will continue to retain quite a large amount of their personal wealth. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Bakers. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were once the most famous televangelists in America, and they certainly were living in quite a lap of luxury. They had beautiful homes, expensive cars, and a ton of money, but that quickly came crashing down amid horrendous scandal. In the late 1980s, after much success, Jim Baker resigned from the PTL ministry after there was a cover-up to hide some hush money that had been given to church secretary Jessica Hahn over an alleged essay situation. Of course, not necessarily a surprise, but definitely not a good look for a televangelist. This led to more interest in people looking into the family more, and soon it was uncovered that there was some sort of accounting fraud going on as well. The consequences for this came by way of felony charges, conviction, imprisonment and divorce. That was the end of that legacy, but since serving his time, Jim Baker hasn't exactly slowed down. He not only remarried and returned to televangelism, but he also currently hosts The Jim Baker Show, which focuses on the end times and the second coming of Christ while promoting emergency survival products. So. That's interesting. In our number 7 spot today, we have Prince Sado. Born in 1735, Prince Sado was the heir to the Korean throne, but unfortunately, he would go on to suffer from extreme mental illness and delusions. Thankfully for historians and those of us interested in history, the wife of the prince created memoirs, and in them, she detailed the horrifying things that happened next. The prince began to kill. He began to hurt and torment people. He basically turned their home into a house of horrors. The prince also endured some pretty horrific treatment from his own father, which of course is not an excuse for the things he did, but it definitely did not help the scenario. Eventually, the family had enough and realized that his behavior would go on to ruin the name of their family forever, so something needed to be done. At the time, tradition stated that if the prince were to be executed, his wife and child would also need to be, but everyone thought that maybe that was a bit too far. Why should they have have to pay for his crimes. This led to the king coming up with quite the bizarre workaround for this. On a hot day in July, the king forced the prince to step into a rice chest, which was then locked behind him. This acted as a way to make it seem like he had caused his own death, which is said to have occurred just a few days later. In our number 6 spot today, we have Don Carlos. This little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kinds of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias in the mid-1500s, as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors, though, are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things, like hurting or taking the lives of animals for fun. Nowadays, we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then, it was like, I don't know 
was anybody even watching you, really? It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to harm a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. Major King Joffrey vibes in that one. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made that the prince didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided that there was absolutely no way in hell. Like, he was so bad that she would rather marry his dad. Which she did, in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. In our number five spot today, we have Prince John. It is said that this may be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although though it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecies surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and very early death, Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane, like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although that is of course impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the day, it was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a really sad thought. In our number four spot today, we have Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy. This is a royal scandal that took place all the way back in 1314, and it starts off with the daughters-in-law of King Philip IV of France. I think that's the fourth. Here's hoping. These young women, Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, were accused of having quite a scandalous affair with two brothers, Philippe and Gautier. So this already is some hot tea, but apparently when Queen Isabella of England, who is the daughter of King Philip of France, so I guess like sister in law with these ladies, when she heard these stories, apparently she's the one who totally outed their affairs. It was obviously a huge deal, and both of the women admitted to their adultery. This led to them being pretty much erased from public knowledge. They had their hair cut short, and they were thrown in a dungeon. And even though Marguerite was meant to be the queen of France through her marriage, when her husband ascended the throne, she stayed locked in the dungeon until the marriage could be annulled. Little is known about what happened to either of them after this point. However, it is believed that Marguerite passed away in 1315 and Blanche 1326. As for the men in this affair, well, they met quite a gruesome fate that involved the removal of their bits and pieces before their swift execution. In our number three spot today, we have the Duggars. All right, one of the most famous reality TV families. And even before the horrors of this family came to light, they were already a family that had fame due to quite a strange reason. If you're unfamiliar with who the Duggars are, you might be more familiar with the show that they used to have on TLC titled 19 Kids and Counting. Yeah, the show ran on TLC for seven years until it was canceled in 2015, and the show featured, well, the Duggar family. The family consisted of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar and their 19 children, nine daughters and 10 sons, all of whose names begin with the letter J. It was an interesting time, and they seemed like this huge, happy, religious family. But in the years since the cancellation of the show, some horrifying things came to light. Initially, the reason that TLC suspended and then subsequently canceled the show is because it came to light that the eldest son in the family, Josh, had done some horrible things and acted violently, horrendously, and inexcusably against a number of girls, even some in his own family. Due to the popularity of the show before these serious stories came to light, there was a spin-off show that was created titled Counting On. This show first aired in December 2015 and stayed on the air for a surprising number of years before it was pulled, and the family yet again found themselves in the center of a scandal that had to do with Josh. This time he was caught in possession of a certain kind of tape that no one should have, and that should not even exist at all. I can't say which kind of tape, but just know it's the worst of the worst. 
worst. These are, of course, some of the worst scandals that have surrounded the family, but truly, it's only a drop in the bucket of the many stories surrounding them. In our number two spot today, we have King Juan Carlos, the former King Juan Carlos of Spain. When he first descended the throne in 1975, was highly looked upon. He was said to be bringing a new age for the country, an age of democracy. His reign lasted for quite a while, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he was forced to abdicate the throne. This was due to a few reasons. Firstly, his public ratings started to plummet after word spread of him being a bit of a womanizer and after an explosive affair, but also because of a lavish elephant hunting trip he took in the middle of an economic collapse. Okay, fair enough. I can see why people were getting their guard up a bit. So the king abdicated the throne in favor of his son Philippe, who sits on it to this day. During this time, however, the scandals in the family weren't only to do with Juan Carlos. In January of 2014, another of his children, his daughter Infanta Cristina, was charged with tax fraud. She has since been acquitted, that happened in 2017, but she was stripped of her title as the Duchess of Palma de Mallorca, and this whole deal had her leaving Spain and moving to Switzerland. The drama doesn't end here, however, because her husband actually was convicted in the case with charges that included embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion, and he received prison time in 2018. In the end, none of the fraud charges have ever been linked back to the former king, but this entire debacle did cause the former ruler to move out of Spain. With his move came a letter, part of which read, quote, guided by the conviction to perform the best service to the Spanish people, their institutions, and you as king, I am communicating my thoughtful decision to move at this time outside of Spain. A decision I make with sadness, but with great serenity. I have been king of Spain for almost 40 years, and during all of them, I have always wanted the best for Spain and for the crown. In our number one spot today, we have the Rothschilds. This family is easily one of the most, if not the most powerful family in the modern era. In fact, it is said that most of us in the Western world don't even realize the impact this family has had on our lives, as our consumer-driven lifestyle is definitely directly related to the monetary systems this family put in place. This would include the United States Federal Reserve. Because of this insane amount of money and power that this family has held for over a century, there are plenty of conspiracy theories going on surrounding them. The conspiracies run deep, and they they go quite dark. They touch on everything from assassination attempts, some successfully completed on sitting presidents, to heinous World War II agendas that would have benefited the family. Of course, they are conspiracies, so no one is quite sure which of these secrets, if any, are true. Even still, the stories and speculation swirl today, waiting for some piece of evidence to maybe bring them to light. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number nine, tiny tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know, because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like, if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. 
Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the length the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was five or six years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. At number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. I number four. Five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances, and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style, and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. 
As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. I suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. At number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings, back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, and they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number nine, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. 
He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really, I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass, and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo, you couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word, philately. 
Philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know if that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it. Yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him. He would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways. This guy was super creepy because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair and he kept them all. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now, born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye-opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem, we love him. Yeah. At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day, and if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally, like, 
fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles. Like castles! More than one. Built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery. Just standing there, just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle, and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrinstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work. Even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. 
That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin that you have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you. I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake, which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the Pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka the Lost Queen of Egypt, was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now, alongside her new young husband, she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens, or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. 
Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at her number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed, and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous, and honestly, I'm the youngest of my family, I kind of get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could, most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. At number 10, marriages. If there's anything we've learned on this channel after talking about marriages so many times, it's that marriages long ago were rarely for love, and this still goes for the samurai. After the samurai really started to flourish during the Edo period, they became some of the highest ranked people in Japanese society. As we've learned before on this channel, when you are a person of high status, your marriages become more of a political or financial bargain than anything else, and these marriages were usually arranged. This meant that a lot of samurai were involved in arranged marriages so as to boost the statuses of other families. As you can imagine, this rarely went over well with the people who were actually being forced to marry, as many of them would have already fallen in love with other people prior to this arrangement. This unfortunately led to a lot of couples to take their own lives rather than marry other people, which is quite Shakespearean when you come to think about it. It was a messed up system, but when it comes to status, people would do anything to make their families more respected, even at the cost of other people's happiness. At number 9, Weapon Testing The Katana Everyone knows it. This was the most famous weapon used by the samurai, and as it was an important weapon, they had to be tested before being put in the hands of Japan's most famous warriors. The elaborate testing that these katanas were put through was called tameshigiri, which translates to test cut in English. This process would have the sword's owner cut through different materials like bamboo, wood, or armor, but there was a darker side to these tests too. The gruesome subsection to tameshigiri testing was called sumonogiri, which translates to the cutting of tied objects. Now you would think, oh, these tied objects were just things like bamboo tied to a tree or something. But no, the tied objects were dead bodies. Yeah, katanas were being tested on dead people. The bodies that were normally used for these weapons testing were usually those of dead criminals, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. It makes you think twice about how these swords got their bloody stamp of approval, especially as sometimes the amount of bodies that the sword cut through would be inscribed on the side of the blade. 
creepy. Now before we carry on talking about the messed up things that the samurai did, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, poverty. When one thinks of a samurai warrior, you don't really think of them as impoverished. I mean at one point they were seen as members of high society, but there also came a time that the samurai started to see money as quote, too tainted to mess with, so they made a conscious effort to avoid it. After the Tokugawa shoguns of the Edo period felt having warm clothing and plenty of food would be detrimental to society, the samurai took this to heart and began living lives of poverty. This has been widely believed because people have grown accustomed to believing in the idea of the noble, humble and honorable samurai, but historians believe that these impoverished samurai could have been influenced by a number of reasons, like their status in society and having things change too quickly for them. Psychological poverty seems to be one of the running theories as to why the samurai started living lives of squalor because they had grown accustomed to their wealth and power, that their expectations of such rose higher than their actual income. At number 7, Wakashudo. As it turns out, the samurai were surprisingly open minded about same sex marriage. However, on the flip side, there was a darker side to their same sex pairings. Back in the days of the samurai, there was a tradition called Wakashudo, where younger men were required to pair up with older samurai. They would essentially become something of a combination of trainees as well as field wives for an older samurai. In return, the older man would be a mentor to his young companion. He would train him and protect his companion until his apprenticeship was completed, where the young man would then move up in ranks. This sounds like it could have been effective in theory, however the practice of Wakashudo wasn't exactly voluntary. Young warriors were expected to follow in this tradition and it was believed that if a handsome young man didn't yield to his older lover, then he would be acting shamefully and this shame would follow him into the next life, resulting him in being disfigured and weak. These young men were being coaxed into this through fear, which is pretty messed up if you ask me. At number 6, Ruthless. This next fact about the samurai is certainly one of the most terrifying, so brace yourselves bumblebees. One of the most messed up traditions of the samurai was something called sushigiri, which when translated means roadside killings, and it's pretty much as straightforward as the name gets. This practice has its roots in honorable duelings, but later became much much darker and evolved into a practice where samurai would sneak around to unexpectedly slash at passing merchants and peasants. What makes this a little more sick and twisted is the excuses that some samurai would give in order to justify their actions. Some would claim that they were simply looking to test their weapon, or they were practicing a new strike, while others would claim that they just felt like attacking someone. Talk about messed up, right? To make things even darker though, there was even a legend floating around at the time that claimed that 1000 sushigiri killings could cure an illness. Sushigiri became such a prevalent issue that it became banned in 1602, but even then it didn't just stop overnight and instead just fizzled out over time, meaning that peasants and merchants were never truly safe from these samurai sneak attacks. At number 5, Wives. Now after learning what we have so far, you can come to understand that the life of a samurai wasn't exactly sunshine and rainbows, right? Well I'm about to tell you about people in the lives of samurai who arguably had it worse than the warriors. Being married to a samurai meant that there was a lot of honor to uphold and that was a lot of pressure. As a result, there was an act that was performed by the wives of the samurai to uphold their honor of their husbands and their family. Some of you may be familiar with the practice of seppuku and if not, we will get into that in a moment but essentially it was a method of taking your life in an honorable way. This practice was reserved for the samurai but their wives had their own variation called jigai. This practice was focused on swiftness and dignity and would be performed for a number of reasons from anointing from her family's shame to preserving her honor in the event of an enemy invasion. But most commonly though jigai was performed by wives whose husbands performed seppuku as samurai wives felt it necessary to end her life if her husband had done the same. The women would tie their knees together as to not be discovered in a compromising position, then she would slit her throat and end her life. At number 4, Last Stand. 
As we are no doubt familiar, in life all things must end, and such is the same with the samurai. Though they were the noble warriors of Japan for many dynasties, eventually things had to change. Towards the end of the 1800s, Japan was looking to enter more modern times, and with that, they were disbanding the samurai clans. By 1877, only one clan remained, and they refused to go down without a fight, and a fight is exactly what they got. On September 25th, 1877, the government sent in 30,000 soldiers to fight the last samurai clan, but with only 500 men and limited supplies, they didn't really stand much of a chance. They knew that this would be their final battle, and so the night before the battle, they had one last sake party, and in the morning, they stormed into battle. Three hours into the fight, only 40 men were left alive. The samurai leader had been fatally wounded, and not too long after that, the remaining fighters were overtaken by the opposing force, thus ending the last samurai clan. At number three, insults. In another installment of dumb reasons the samurai would randomly kill people, let's talk about the practice of killing people who insulted others. These days, if we feel as though we've been insulted by someone, usually a clap back is in order, but back in the days of the samurai, things were a little different and a lot bloodier. The samurai were allowed to practice something called kirisude gomen, which translates to authorization to cut and leave. Essentially, the samurai were given the authority to legally kill someone if they felt like they had been insulted or disrespected. The only fine prints to this was that the killing had to happen immediately after they were disrespected, and the victim was a member of the lower class. The initial insult and subsequent retaliation by the samurai also had to have been witnessed by someone else who could back up the samurai story, but the samurai were allowed to use their own friends and servants as witnesses, which seems a little biased, but then again, we're talking about killing people because your feelings were mildly bruised. The only downside that this posed to the samurai is that if they were found guilty of misusing their authority to practice kirisute gomen, they would be given a severe punishment of beheading and their house would be abolished, meaning that the samurai's son would not be able to inherit the title of samurai after their father's passing. At number two, seppuku. Now remember I mentioned the practice of seppuku a little while ago? Well, let's talk about it. Seppuku was a ritualistic method of taking your own life where a samurai would slice his stomach open with a small sword. This was seen as an honorable way to die on the battlefield and was established sometime during the 12th century. There were two variations on performing seppuku. One was slicing the abdomen vertically and horizontally, then the samurai would just bleed out and die in excruciating and drawn out death. Doesn't really sound too jazzy to me. But the other, and arguably less excruciating way, was for the samurai to perform a horizontal cut across his abdomen, then immediately following that, his comrade would decapitate him, ending his life instantly. Still a pretty horrific way to go, but at least it's a lot quicker than the other method, right? Outside of the battlefield though, when a samurai would prepare to take his own life, he would first write a death poem, have a couple shots of sake, and then perform the ritual. And finally, at number one, for the streets. Now let's get to talking about what I think is probably the most bizarre and messed up thing that the samurai did. During a period of peace, the samurai didn't really have anything to do. I mean, they were warriors. But when there were no battles or wars to fight in, they kind of got bored. Their swords were just sitting there, gathering dust. So what did they do to fight their boredom? Well, they took to the streets, of course. A number of unemployed samurai from the Edo period took to the streets and formed gangs with other highborn youths. One street gang called the Kabukimono were known for being quite flamboyant, wearing strange clothes and using strange slang and they would roam the streets harassing people and getting into fights with other gangs. The natural enemy of the Kabukimono was the rival gang called Kyokagu, and they were known as vigilantes made up of lower class people who protected the people. The clashes between Kyokagu and Kabukimono caused a lot of bloody gang violence in the Edo period, so even when there was no outside conflicts, there was still bloodshed. Kicking off the list at number 10, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, here we go. Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Watshaw Longfellow, Longfellow, great last name, really love that. His wife, Fanny, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that she sadly didn't survive. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is. And the fact that candles were used everywhere obviously didn't help. You're a walking ball of cotton and some of these dresses were six feet wide cages, literally, I'll get into that later on. But arsenic dresses were on a whole new level of deadly, even without the 
lit candles, this dress could already just kill you. Arsenic was used back then to get that green look. Real arsenic was used. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and ended up dying a horrible, horrible way. Her fingernails had turned green, green foam was coming out of their mouth, the whites of her eyes had turned green. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Yeah, the 1800s were a wild time. And believe me, it only gets weirder from here. Number nine, the hobble skirt. Here we go, we're gonna slowly walk like penguins for this one. Just from this 1910 headline alone, the hobble skirt sounds like a good time. The June 12 headline reads, the hobble is the latest freak in women fashion. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Doesn't that pull you in? I want one already, let's do it, let's. French designer Paul Poiret made these to free the bust while shackling the legs. Just what you need to move around on uneven stone roads back hundreds of years ago. We love it. Love the practicality of the outfit. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and is, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons like losers. Ha, what are you, walking? So they could actually walk around, you know? What a weird thing to do. These hobble skirts were worn by the, you know, the fancy and they were like, Mm, we don't walk, we're too fancy for that. We'll just stand in one place and do this a lot. And also this, I guess. I don't know what this is. These hobble skirts were so popular at the time that upper class folks sought out a new fashion trend that made them look even fancier than the rest. So they just did it for clout. And they look stupid. I'll say, they look kind of stupid. Number eight, macaroni. This one's extra cheesy. Macaroni joke, we got it. Back in the mid 1700s, aristocratic British men would wear these large wigs, and I mean large, large wigs. These things were comedically big, but what would make them so unique was the tiny little hat on top of this massive wig. Or it was a feather, a feather or a little hat. A little Monopoly sized piece hat, just right on top of this. The Yankee Doodle Rhyme mentions this macaroni, that's the macaroni they're referring to. Stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. He called it KD Mac and Cheese. These British men were inspired after traveling across Europe and it's named after macaroni like the pasta because it signifies sophistication and worldliness. Every time I eat KD, I'll be like, sophistication, sophisticatedication. That was the whole point of the rhyme, that any average Joe can just put a old feather in their hair and then be as valuable as macaroni. You can be macaroni, guys, you can do it. Hit that thumbs up and then we'll all be macaroni. Number seven, the hoop skirt. The hoop skirt is way too much. I mean, for starters, it looks like something you would find on a playground. Children can for sure do chin-ups on the hoop skirt. These skirts were six foot wide, like hoops, they were the talk of the town. Would have been perfect for the pandemic, actually, six by six, nice. They were the talk of the town around the 1700s and it was often handmade from whalebone or basket willow. And if you attended King Louis XVI's court, it might as well be a packed bar. You're sneaking by everybody, these small passageways between people and their now six foot hoop radius skirts. It's not, not practical at all, but they did look fancy. Later on in the mid 1800s, a newer version of the skirt came out and these were better because they were made of steel. I'm not joking. This was considered new and or improved. They could produce these more often now being made of steel. So this was really the first time in history where your legs could also actually move around while you looked good. We went from hobble skirts to cage skirts. I think we're getting better. I think maybe. Number six, paper dresses. Okay, we're not getting better at all. Moving on to some modern fashion trends, this short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. Paper dresses. Yes, it's as ridiculous as it sounds. Paper dresses to go-go. Just don't spill anything at all or make any sudden movements and you're good. You ever played Paper Mario? You're basically cosplaying Paper Mario. The Scott Paper Company made these, not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quick, of course. Fidget spinners were only four years ago, so if you want to talk about paper dresses, open that cupboard and check yourself before you wreck yourself. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. They couldn't even keep up with this work. It went so well that other companies hopped on board and they too began making these paper dresses. It was just everywhere. Over three million dollars were spent on this fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix at one point. It was a big deal. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper either. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't good either. The dress was made of a disposable material called DuraWeave. Believe it or not, slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses, it was a bit better. It's been compared to the thick paper bit that you get when you're at the dentist, that flimsy material that bunches up and then pokes your neck. It has like the weird chain that's not really connected too well, that tiny little clip thing. It's made of that, a whole dress made of that. Have fun at prom. 
Don't light on fire. Number five, wax cones. This next one we need to bring back. I'm tired of washing my beanie. It smells, you don't wanna know, honestly. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. We're going way back for this one. They would sit on top of your head, and back in 2019, we actually found evidence that they were in fact used. Before then, we just saw them on paintings and such. What would happen is men and women would wear this cone, and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone, and the cone itself was made of oils, fats, resins, and it would be placed on their wig or directly on their head to make them smell better as the day went by. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. Number four, crack hose. Today's footwear is pretty comfortable. We have shoes that correct your stride while you take your morning jog. We have Crocs, which, you know, they're just a blessing, you know, just in general, they're great. Crack hose were a style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century in Europe. The thing with these long-toed shoes, they first appeared in the 12th century and they would come and go over time as most fashion trends do. But the Krako, this thing was twice as long as your foot. People are tripping over these things left, right, and center. They look ridiculous. Why were they so long? Why did they keep coming back over and over? Named after the city, of course, that they were made in, Krakows were used by both men and women, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the cooler the dude. Yeah, size did matter. These things would be stuffed with horse hair or moss, but the insane part is, is that these things were so long, a string would have to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee, so it was like, you know, had to have the cool curve. You had to have that interesting curve. We need to bring these back immediately. Imagine tying a Krako to your knee before prom. You'd be fired up. You'd be doing like the sea walk in no time. Number three, wigs. Okay, I mentioned the macaroni look, little hat with a big wig, but wigs were such a big deal that they deserve their own point on this list. You see it so often in movies and TV, any plot that takes place in the early 17th century, it's just wigs galore. This all began when Louis XIII of France wore a wig to hide his baldness. Yeah, people love copying royalty. Even when Queen Elizabeth's teeth were black and rotten from eating so many sweets, people copied that look. They made their teeth look rotten because, well, obviously, that's the cool thing. Gross, don't do that, brush your teeth. In the 17th century, syphilis was also to blame. This was a bad time in Europe, of course, long before antibiotics, most things were pretty bad. But the side effects of syphilis include sores and hair loss. What better way to hide the fact that you're losing a bit of hair than to wear a wig nine times as noticeable in public than if you were just to have patchy hair? This is a solution, I guess. It kicked off with Louis XIV at just age 17. He hired 50 wig makers. His cousin, Charles II, he was going gray around the same time, so he too wore a wig, and then everyone thought wigs were cool, and then Bob's your uncle. I'm starting to go gray already. Next time you see me, I'll be wearing a 17th century lice-filled, flammable, stinky wig, because that's better, apparently. Number two, bombasting. The origin of stuffing your bra, let's do it. Mr. Boombastic, is it fantastic after all? What does it even mean to call somebody Boombastic? What is this? Well, back in the 16th century, if you looked like a literal couch, you were considered royalty. The bigger the belly, the bigger the arms, the bigger the everything, the better. Size mattered a lot back then. Men and women would stuff cotton, wool, or sawdust. Yeah, they would stuff sawdust in their clothing to appear more muscular or to seem like they ate a lot. Now it's so funny because while of course this makes sense in history and stuff, like I just mentioned, the legs of these guys were always so hmm, tiny. They would more often than not make their arms look ripped and their bellies huge, but they still needed to move around and be like, ah oh, yes, and like, you know, that whole my lady stuff. A guy the size of a minivan isn't intimidating. It looks more uncomfortable than anything. And in case you're wondering, yes, men would usually stuff just one part of their trousers. That's just false advertising, my friend. And finally, number one, bustles. All that junk inside your trunk, what are you going to do with it? Saving my personal favorite for last, of course, bustles were a fun little mix of everything on this list. This was also known as the Grecian Bend. It came to town in the 1870s. Now, remember how we'd wear cage dresses that extended six feet and was just non-practical in any way? Well, they modified that so it was basically just your behind that was poofed out. This fabric was draped behind the butt. That was the... Uh, uh, uh. The fabric was usually draped behind the butt. That was the original style. But some people got smart and began stuffing the back just to make it, you know, a little higher, a little bit bigger, a little bit more, hmm, a little more mm, to it. And then eventually, you look like an absolute dump truck. So some eyes were facing you, which was a bonus back then. The bustle, looking back at it, pun intended, is ridiculous. This was not comfortable or practical at all. It began as a small piece of fabric that would hold the dress up, and then it became this. Whenever I see this style, I always think of Aunt Fanny from the movie Robots. That movie is criminally underrated. I'm gonna end on that thought. Go watch Robots.